Hello and welcome to this month's Q&A session with me, Phil. And in this month, like always, I'm going to be taking questions from Instagram Live. And I've also been sent through a series of questions, which I'll name off in just a second. But before I do that, don't forget to follow me at Leathercraft Masterclass on Instagram, where there's tons more content that you're missing out on here. So don't forget to go over there and give me a follow on there too. So what questions do I have in store for you guys today? Well, number one, we have a question on Stingray skin. We also have a question on presenting products to customers in a way they understand. Reverse pricking irons. Tips for beginners on all use. And also how to cut an English point on the end of your belt or strap without using an English point cutter, okay? Like one of these punches here. So I'm gonna be giving a demonstration on how you can do that in your workshop without having that particular tool where you can get just as good results, but also you can change the angles and play around with the shapes. So I'm gonna give you a demonstration on how to do that, but I'm also gonna have a little bit of fun and show you how to burnish with nothing more than your hand. So without further ado, we're gonna go live on Instagram, take some live questions as well, and then we'll be going through these main ones. Don't forget, if you want to get your questions in, you guys on YouTube, on Instagram, every month I take questions in the stories, so you can DM them to me or you can send them through with the story sticker. Okay, so let's go live and take it from there. All right, so without further ado, let's get started on April's Q&A. So question number one is, is it possible to skive Stingray? Okay, is it possible to skive Stingray skin? So what is Stingray skin? Uh, it could be of a series of fish, even shark could be called Stingray at times or Chagrin, but they all possess similar qualities, which you have these small circular beads, uh, almost like bone across the surface. It's very distinctive. There's nothing else quite like it in the, the world of skin and leather. And underneath you have a fibrous layer. So there's the two main layers is your firm hard layer on the top and a fibrous layer. And the top layer is made from uh, enamel and dentine, okay? Very similar to teeth in that sense. And you can buy unsanded, which is more spherical on the surface, very interesting texture. And you can buy it sanded, which opens up a very different, unique look to it and flattens out the surface as well. So the person here is asking, is it possible to skive Stingray? Now, normally skiving, you're using something like this, skiving skins and leather using a skiving knife. Now, if you try to do that with uh, Stingray skin, you would instantly blunt your knife. It doesn't matter what kind of super steel, powdered steel that you're working with, uh, it's gonna be the edge that you had, okay? because it's so hard and so tough, it just strips the edge of almost anything. So it's not possible to really skive Stingray. You could, for example, skive the underneath, the fibrous layer, but that's the foundation for the pearls that sit on top. So if you skive that away, they're just gonna start falling apart and you'll have no strength, and that's not what you want. Now, what you can do is use a drum sander now you can use a regular drum sander, or if you want a bit more detail, you could use uh, a Dremel, a rotary tool with an extension, and a, a small micro drum sander. And you can very carefully sand that down, right down and thin out the fibrous layer as well. And you can, call, you can use that for overlaps, uh, for example, watch straps, okay? where you're gonna have something over the top. You can do it for even turned edges, but it's gonna be very niche areas that you really use that particular technique. So it's not, it is possible to thin it down, not skiving it in the literal sense, but it's possible to thin it down with a small drum sander. So that's something to, uh, to consider. But if you're attaching the Stingray to something else for support, then you would, Probably if you needed to thin the edges, for example, you would thin that down rather than the Stingray itself. So I hope that answered that particular question. How are you guys getting on on Instagram? Yeah, just double checking. We don't have any uh, unanswered comments. Excellent. Okay, so question number two is a little bit more on the side of uh, selling your work, okay? So how do you present your high quality products to a customer without being too technical. 
Okay, so the person who's asked this question has probably had a little bit of self-awareness, uh, perhaps maybe talked about their work or something to a friend and the friend's completely confused, or maybe they've seen people talking online using really complex language that most people wouldn't understand. But it's an interesting question. How do you present your high quality products to a customer without being too technical? And we can all, to a certain extent, be uh, accused of doing this, where we talk more like an expert using uh, the, the language of leathercraft. We have all these weird and wonderful words, you know, skiving, burnishing, and saddle stitching, and all these uh, weird and wonderful filatoos, and, uh, you know, <laughs> The list could go on. I'm sure you can come up with many, many more. But all these words are just not common knowledge, really, outside of leather craft or very few other crafts. So it's very easy to lose people and confuse people don't buy, generally. Uh, you might be uh, familiar with that. If you go to buy a product, you're not 100% sure what you need. It's not evident. It's, you're having to think really hard to figure out what you need. And you end up going, you know what, I'm, not, I'm just not going to buy it. I'm going to leave it or buy something else instead. So two things I've identified on how to sell your work without being too technical. Uh, number one is avoid using terms that they don't understand. Okay, avoid using terms that they don't understand. Now, when you talk with other leather crafters, uh, you're going online researching leather craft, you're on a leather craft forum, you're on a leather craft Facebook group, you're follow tons of leather crafters on Instagram, you watch videos by leather crafters on YouTube, your kind of circle is constantly using these terms and phrases all the time. It becomes your normal. So it's very easy to start using that. But terms like, uh, you know, stitched with linen, okay, or stitched with French linen, what, what does that mean to anyone? A lot of people might associate linen with bed sheets. Okay, so you've stitched that with French bed sheets. Okay, it sounds funny until you don't know what that means. Not everybody knows what linen is, okay? Uh, another one could be uh, vegetable tanned leather, okay? Another one of my bugbears, I don't actually like the term vegetable tanned leather because not many people are really going to associate, you know, could link up tanning leather with vegetables, okay? If you say vegetables to most people, or vegetable, they're going to be thinking carrots, peas, broccoli, swede, sweet corn, potatoes, etc. Okay, vegetables. So it's vegetable tan. That makes no sense to most people, unless you explain what that is. Not everybody's going to go from, okay, vegetables, vegetation, uh, oak bark, uh, bark, twigs, sumac, uh, ground up into a tea, dip leather nine months later, vegetable tanned leather. Not many people are going to make that connection. I'd much rather it be called bark tanned leather, okay? 80% of people are going to get what that means, pretty much. It's got bark in it somehow, and it's tanned, it's natural, it's great, and 20% might think it's something to do with dogs, but bark tanned leather I think would be more accurate, because most of the time that's what it is. So uh, just be very careful that you're not constantly using phrases you know, it's vegetable tanned leather, hand stitched with French linen thread with burnished edges, um, you know, shell cordovan, all this kind of thing. A lot of people don't know what that is. So you'll need to break down what it is so that they understand what it is and they can understand. The next thing kind of ties in with that, number two, which is don't assume they know why something is better. Okay, don't assume they know why something is better. Why does, uh, you know, French, why is French calf better than calf? If they know what calf is, okay, most people probably do, but why is French calf better? Okay, we use French calf made in a tannery in blah, 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 that's been doing it the same way for 150 years. Great, now it's romantic, now I can attach some kind of connection to it and I perhaps understand some reason why it's better. Uh, we use, we hand stitch all our leather goods for, because it increases strength. And maybe put a little diagram in there if you want to, or just say because it increases strength. It's stronger than a machine stitch. So it's more durable, lasts longer, and you can hand it down to your children. You know, it's, you're giving it some, something for them to latch on of why it's better. 
So don't just reel off a lot of terms they don't understand. Make sure that it's something they can connect to. And if you're using a term that describes why it's better, just let them know why that thing makes it better, okay? So how do you present your high quality product to a customer without being too technical? Think like someone who doesn't quite understand what it is, okay? Don't use technical terms. And if you're saying it's vegetable tanned leather because you believe it's superior in some way, explain why it is superior, okay? Can you simulate or have a mock conversation on how to sell to a client? <laughs> Might as well ask me to sell this pen. <laughs> who, can get, who can get that film reference? Uh, no, that would be very unnatural for me to do right now. <laughs> or something to do with dogs. Bark tan leather, woof, yeah. Uh, question number three, and this one is uh, to do with pricking irons. And the question is, do I need reverse pricking irons as well to pre-punch layered pieces from opposite sides? Now, going on from my previous, don't talk like you assume people know what you're talking about. Uh, two pricking irons here, okay? They are different sizes. This is a number five, Dixon number five. This is a Dixon number six, but we can assume that they're the same. Now, this is a standard pricking iron, okay? What we call obverse, okay? Just a standard orientation and if I hold it up to the camera, the angle is like this, okay? Now, a reverse pricking iron is essentially, when you hold them together, a mirror image of that. So this one, the angle of the prongs that make the marks in the leather that you follow with your awl or your stitching is on the opposite side. So they're opposing. But what happens when I bring them until they're facing each other, okay? I know they're different sizes, but the angles of the prongs actually match up, okay? So it's now connected as a mirror image. This is opposing, this is mirrored, all right? So if you were to get two obverse, two standard irons, they're the same side by side, end to end would be an X, okay? They're opposing. So where would you use this? Why would you buy an obverse pricking iron? And then eventually we'll talk about uh, whether or not we need one. Where would you use it? So for example, if you are making a, a, a handle for a briefcase, so you'd prick the top part down the side seam, okay? And then you'd prick the bottom part with your reverse irons, okay? So opposite side. And what you'll do is as you push through with your awl, because it's very thick uh, layered leather, you're not gonna go through it with your pricking iron. When you push through, your angle that your pricking iron has set the awl at will match on the opposite side. Now, what does that mean? That means that your stitching is gonna be more accurate. Okay, that's all it means. The back seam is gonna be nice and accurate. Angles are gonna be on point as well, and it's gonna look nice and neat. Now, if you didn't use a reverse pricking iron, you could push through with an awl, but you might come a little bit high on one with the awl, a bit low, You've got nothing really to aim for, and what that can cause is a little bit of a change in the stitching. The accuracy can sometimes be lost when you've got that much of leather to go through. So it can be handy to use a reverse pricking iron. Now you may think to yourself, the underside of a handle on a briefcase is never really seen, and that's true. So it really depends on personal preference. But another area that I definitely do use this is, uh, or like to use this, is box stitching, okay? So you have a box, thick leather box, you have an angle, a uh, 90 degree angle, and you prick mark a seam on one side and you prick mark a seam with reverse irons on the other side, and as you push your all blade through, it matches up and gives you a nice, accurate seam. Now there are ways and techniques around that, and I discuss that in the courses as well, but the area that I really like to use them is on attaché cases. So the Bloomsbury attaché case course is something that I showcase that where I use this with a regular number five iron up on the wall there. Um, and that allowed me some really nice, accurate seams on both sides uh, and it makes it easy to do as well. You just push the awl mate all the way through. If the awl is slightly off, you'll see it quite quickly because it should be coming through the hole made by the reverse pricking iron. So you can then just pull it back out, readjust and push it through to keep your stitching accurate. Uh, I pre-punch with my awl when I need to go through some, something that thick. Yes, 
uh, and you still can pre-punch if you pre-prick both sides and then pre-punch all the way through uh, you, again, you'll be more accurate than just going uh, with one marking on one side and an all only. Okay, so do you need reverse pricking eyes? Do you need them? Not necessarily. It depends on the kind of work that you do. They're a little bit niche, so it's not always necessary. And you can get away with not needing them. But if you require a little bit more accuracy and it's uh, something that you find makes your work a little bit easier, a little bit neater, then it's something to consider, but obviously it's an extra expense because you're ending up buying twice the amount of pricking irons. But saying that, if you're using it to go through very thick leather, um, you're probably going to be using thicker threads, it's on a bigger project, and you maybe only need the larger sizes, so you won't need to go it through your whole inventory and then double the number of pricking irons to get reverse in there. So next question, question number four, uh, other than practice, what are some tips for beginner ore users? Are there any common mistakes? So this person is obviously either brand new to using an awl or they've been hand stitching for a short period of time and they want to integrate all use. Maybe they've seen a limitation in what they can do with just going all the way through with a pricking iron and they want to start experimenting uh, and get a little bit more skill around the pricking iron. So other than practice, what are some tips for beginner ore users? Are there common mistakes? So I've listed a few. Uh, number one, avoid picking up bad habits at the start that will be hard to unlearn later on. Um, I see this a lot uh, in people who eventually pick up the ore either through necessity um, or they just decide to but you can tell that they've got experience hand stitching, but it's very awkward to see them use the awl. And sometimes they will push the awl through and then put it down and then do the stitch and then pick it back up again and do that, uh, which really destroys your flow and your consistency uh, because you, you lose that feel every single time and the rear side of the stitches will usually pay the price for that. I also see um, one where People have obviously used the hand stitching without one and then they'll use an awl. Okay, if you can see that, my, my black t-shirt. They'll use an awl between their pinky finger and their ring finger and they're stitching and then they'll kind of jab it in every so often, do their stitch and then jab it in. I mean, it's all well and good. It's a bit of an afterthought technique, uh, but I'm sure that would play havoc on my knuckles eventually. So health-wise, I'm not sure how good that would be for your finger joints. But uh, accuracy on that, and it would be very easy to accidentally jab the surface of the leather. So picking up good techniques um, from the beginning is, is ideal. So avoid bad habits at the start. They'll be hard to unlearn later on. So if you think, oh, I'm going to do it a different way because the, the way that most uh, what they consider masters do it is now oh, it's too technical. So I'm going to figure out another way. And you start getting used to that. And further down the line, you realize it's a bad technique and it's making your stitching worse. So next uh, thing I've picked up on is use a stitching pony until you become proficient enough to use clams. So using an awl and using clams kind of go hand in hand because it's a, a little bit more efficient to do it that way, I find. But having something upright where you can see the awl coming through the other side visually and you've got something visually to see your needle touch the blade and as you pull the blade out, the needle sinks in and it makes it much easier. Once you kind of learn that and you get that mind muscle connection, okay, the hand eye co uh, coordination, then you can transition to that to uh, using saddler's clams, either English or French saddler's clams. And I've got videos on that as well if you want to watch on my YouTube. So, starting with a stitching pony, just to take one of the uh, challenging variable out because on uh, uh, stitching clams, you can't actually see the rear side of the stitches. Is all by feel, so you need to pick up that skill first of all. So take it in stages. Uh, last one there is get proper education from a craftsman you trust. Okay, now you probably know that I do leather craft courses. I'm going to plug my own courses. I do have a course on hand stitching, hand stitching with a cast, without a cast, how to use an awl, pricking iron, um, basically demonstration of French seams and also bind, edge binding as well. Uh, but it's always good to try and 
find someone who you aspire to be more like or someone who that you would like, you know, like to pick up their level of skill, watch how they do things, watch their YouTube or Instagram, ask them questions if necessary, but try and get a trusted source where you can then either get your technique critiqued, maybe it's an in-person course, or you can send a video to someone, even myself, just to give you a critique and see how you're doing and make any necessary changes. So get proper education from a, a trusted source. Uh, and lastly, I do have a tip for you guys. Uh, and I, I use this in my course, The Techniques of Hand Stitching. Uh, it's called a pinky loop, okay? It's not something you would use forever. Consider it training wheels, but there's nothing wrong with using it for the rest of your career. But it's a loop, it's custom designed. I have a video for this. I can't remember if I just mentioned that, but I'll put it in on YouTube, especially in the description below. And what it is, is a, a strip of leather all the way around, holds onto your pinky and make sure that it doesn't go anywhere, okay? So what are the benefits of that? Well, one, it's on a pivot, okay, it pivots. So as I'm stitching, I don't, I can actually relax my hand. I'm not using these fingers to hold on. I can relax them so that I can stitch a little bit easier. It's just like almost stitching without one, except there's something in your hand there, but you can relax it, it doesn't affect it. And when you need it, you just bring your thumb back and the awl is back in play again. Uh, the other thing is you can't drop it on the floor because it's attached to you. Uh, but another big benefit is it's tightened on there. I mean, there's a layer of pigskin underneath for comfort, but if I pull that back, I can actually unscrew it with a small screwdriver because it's screwed in to the, uh, to the half, the handle, and rotate it to the exact angle that I'm using with my pricking iron. So if I'm using a pricking iron that's like that, and I have another one that's like that, well, I can just loosen it, rotate it, tighten it back up, and make sure that it matches. And that way, the, the hole that I make with the awl blade all the way through is gonna match the front, so the back will be exactly the same. Sometimes it's actually very easy to change the angle if you're inexperienced doing that. So it's a good one to start with, and eventually you can take it off. Once you build that habit, you build that technique, it's a, bit of a little bit of a transition, but you'll get the idea, the general idea. So uh, video for that, it's gonna be on, uh, when for you guys on Instagram, when it comes out on YouTube, um, I'm gonna premiere it probably uh, in the next few days. I'll put a link in there, but it's on my YouTube account. It's one of the earlier ones. Okay, so demonstration coming up, guys. Demonstration coming up. Just gonna move these out of the way. So our last question is, uh, how do I get the perfect English point on a strap or a belt without the punch? Okay, without in all block capitals for extra emphasis. Uh, so I'm gonna show you rather than tell you. So I'm just gonna move these out of the way. Uh, you guys on Instagram. I hope you don't get seasickness. <laughs> Give me one second. The big camera needs to rotate. And refocus. Do you sharpen your tiny edge bevelers on your own? And if yes, then how? Uh, perhaps I can give a bit of a demo uh, another time. I did literally a few days ago come out with a course, Techniques of the Blade Part 2, Advanced Sharpening, and in that one I go through how to sharpen from scratch. Okay, so how to sharpen both sides of the edge beveler from scratch uh, and then polish it. So I'm not sure if you have access to those courses, but that is on there using macro footage as well, which is obviously much better. What's the best way to use a curved awl through thin leather? You know what? I don't actually have a curved awl, uh, shoemaker's awl, so uh, not the best one to ask. Probably a shoemaker would be best for that. Okay, so this is a piece of leather. This is English bridal leather. Thickness-wise, we're looking at about three, yeah, about three millimeters thick. Uh, about uh, one and a half inches or 38 millimeters. So it's gonna be about the same, yeah. Okay, so what are we gonna do on this one? So instead of using an English point strap cutter, which I have here, which you would place over there, make sure it's centralized, of course, and then you can whack it on the top and you end up with a cut that mirrors this. Okay, the English point looks like the top of a church window. So what I'm going to do is start out by taking a pair of wing dividers. Now, 
unlock them. We're going to find the center here. You know, you can measure this and use a ruler. What I'm going to do is just give it a, a bit of a guesstimation here. How far am I? A bit too wide. This is where my OCD kicks in. Oh, wow, look at that. Okay, so I've made a central point here. I'm just going to push through that with a little bit more gusto. Maybe you can see that. Now what I'm going to do is open this up to just slightly wider than the width of this piece here. Okay, and just, just kind of loosely tighten it, not too much. So I'm going to place one side of my wing dividers in here. And then the other side, I'm going to bring it around and butt it up to the side. Can you see that? Okay, when it hits the side, I'm going to press down. So now it's indexed in to the table itself. So I can lift up the opposite side, bring it over, and then make a scratch. Okay, so be very careful that you're keeping your leather nice and straight. So it's not moving about. When I've done one side, I'm going to lift this side up, bring it over to the opposite side. Again, I'm going to butt that up to the side of the leather and press down into the work surface table. Coming over to the opposite side and I'm making a scratch. Okay, And both sides are coming around and going back into the end, that point. So what I have here now is a church window style, if you can see that. You guys on Instagram, maybe not because the quality is a little bit lower. But I have something that mirrors this very, very closely. So I can take a round knife, and this is the one I sharpened in the recent course as well. So some of you might recognize it. And I can just place that down and just pull that leather through very carefully. Minding fingers. So I'm actually moving the leather through the blade on this side and on the other side. I won't do that because my fingers are a little bit further forwards now. So what I can do is just use the tail end. Slowly curving it round, moving your fingers, making sure at any point if you slip, there's no finger in front of it. So what you have now, bring that to the side, is a point. Okay, just like an English point. Now I can take my edge beveler, like so, and starting on one side. Take that off. And then do the same thing on the rear side. Now you might need to practice this a little bit. And you don't have to use a round knife. You can use a regular knife if you want to. Okay, such as a craft knife, snap off blade, l'indispensable, whatever you happen to be using. Okay, and now, you can then burnish that, okay? So, <laughs> luckily you guys can't see because I'm gonna lick it. Lovely, okay, you guys on YouTube got some sound effects there. <laughs> All right, so uh, what should we burnish it with? Uh, let's try my hand. So, let's see if we can get that going. So it is possible to actually use your hand to burnish. Calluses help. <laughs> and then to get a, a final polish on there, what I like to do is just get my fingernails. There you go. You guys on Instagram can hear that in the microphone a little bit closer. Okay, so there you go. <laughs> you 
you can actually burnish reasonably well with just your hands and your nails. So there you go. So that's a weird way of finishing it, but that's uh, the English point uh, without having an English point. Now, of course, let me give you a quick demo of how much faster that is. I'm not going to spend too long centering that up, but... Uh, Once you got it pretty centered. Okay, just a, qu a quick whack, and that's gonna give you uh, a much quicker option there. So uh, it will take a little bit more beveling, but apart from that, it's much quicker. So I recommend uh, for when you run out of tokenol, yeah, I do have some somewhere. Uh, incoming new course, hand burnishing, the technique of the last. <laughs> burnishing by hand, literally, yeah, yeah. ASMR. I read a book on leather tools warning everyone that if your tool can cut leather, it can cut them. Well, I would have thought so. Um, in that fashion, no one in their right mind would mess with a good leather crafter. <laughs> I'll see where you went with that. That's funny. Yes, it's, it's very true. Don't, don't mess with us. <laughs> okay, guys. Uh, so that's the end of it. Um, don't forget, if you're brand new to this and you're brand new to the channel, uh, on leathercraftmasterclass.com. Don't forget, I'm still offering the free tool buyer's guide and free leather selection video, which will show you exactly what tools you need to get for your level and also how to identify good quality leather. Two of the cornerstone uh, pieces of information you need to know to start on your journey towards fine leather goods. So thank you for joining me in today's live. If you got value from any of the information here, or at least you were entertained at some point, uh, don't forget to give me a thumbs up, okay? So just give me a thumbs up below, let me know. And if you have any questions, uh, anything else you'd like to add, your own experiences, anything you want to share with the community as well, then don't forget to comment below and share your thoughts. In the meantime, thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next Q&A session.